All right, welcome everybody to today's webinar hosted by the International Solar Energy Society ISIS and by the IEA SAC Solar Academy. We are very pleased to have all of you here and we are especially happy to welcome back the IEA SAC Solar Academy. This is the third Solar Academy webinar ISIS is hosting this year and we are looking forward to many more exciting webinars to come. Today's webinar will present building integrated solar envelope systems and the webinar will last one and a half hours and will of course include the Q&A section for you, the audience. My name is Arabella, I am the communications and outreach officer here at the ISIS HQ in Freiburg, Germany, and I will give you a short introduction into ISIS and the work we do, as we have many new participants joining us on this webinar today. The International Solar Energy Society ISIS is a non-profit UN accredited membership NGO. Our vision is 100% renewable energy for all, used efficiently and wisely. ISIS represents a diverse membership of academics, researchers, energy practitioners, consultants, students and business advocates. ISIS works together with like-minded organizations from countries all around the world to advance the renewable energy transformation. There are many benefits to joining ISIS as a member, and you can find out more on our homepage. Some of the benefits are the exclusive access to this presentation and webinar recordings, such as today's in the ISIS webinar archive. ISIS members can also get discounts and even free registration to ISIS events and partner events. Every month, ISIS publishes a newsletter for our members where you can follow our progress and share your news. Members can also subscribe to our academic journal, Solar Energy, which is our flagship publication. And in the ISIS online bookshop, ISIS members qualify for reduced prices on the different publications. So we welcome those who are not yet members to join today to support our work. For those who already are a member, we thank you for your support. Now some brief information on the webinar and especially the Q&A section before we start. During today's webinar, our expert speakers will give their presentations and this will be followed by a Q&A section for you, the audience. For the Q&A section, we invite you to send in your questions and we are looking forward to your participation. When sending in the questions, please write who the question is for and keep your question short and precise. Please feel free to start sending in your questions at any time throughout the webinar. And now I'm happy to introduce our moderator for today, Babel App. Babel will introduce you to our speakers and guide us through the Q&A session. Babel is the founder and managing director of the German consultancy Zorico for solar market research and international communication. She is responsible for the international newsletter on the web portal solarthermalworld.org, reporting exclusive about market and technology trends in the solar and heating cooling sector. Now, I am happy to hand over to Babel. Babel, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Barabella, for the nice introduction. My name is Bärbel Epp Sorico, and I'm the moderator of today's webinar. And I will shortly introduce you also the IA Solar Heating and Cooling Program, which is sort of the organizer behind this webinar in the form of the Solar Academy that Arabella already mentioned. So let's start the presentation. Yes, well, the IEA Solar Heating and Cooling Program is a research platform, one of the oldest ones actually behind below the IEA, um, already since 1977. It gathers 20 member countries, the European Commission and four international organizations. So we cover a lot of countries all around the world and we have experts around 400 from all five continents. They work in research platforms which have a lot of different solar thermal specific topics such as storage, PV thermal, district heating, historic building, daylighting, industrial water management and neighborhood planning. If you want to learn more about the outcomes of our projects you and our research, you are very welcome to join the regular webinars, which are on the quarterly basis hosted by ISIS. You find all the former recordings under this list link, which is given here. You can also watch videos from conferences with experts, short four to five minute videos, which you find under this link also on the website Solar Academy. 
We organize national days and conferences, and the highlight of this year is the International Conference on Solar Heating and Cooling for Buildings and Industry, SHC, in Chile. We welcome you to join and study the program. It's a four-day uh, conference from the 4th to the 7th of November 2019, and I think it will be the key meeting of um, experts and researchers in solar heating and cooling this year. You'll find more information under this given link. Besides, online trainings are part of the Solar Academy and they will be organized under request of the IEA Solar Heating and Cooling member countries. Recent trainings have taken place in China, South Africa and UK. Here are some more contact information, our general website. For further questions, the email of the Secretariat. You can for sure also follow us on social media or the YouTube channel. So today's webinar is in the series of Solar Academies, the third one. The title is Building Integrated Solar Envelope Systems for Edge Wake and Lighting, Task 56. Researchers like short forms, so make sure that you understand BISIS in the sake of this webinar, which stands for Building Integrated Solar Envelope Systems. Edgewake is probably well known. It's heating, ventilation and air conditioning. And TASK is actually the word within the IA solar heating cooling for these international research platforms. And not to use the long name all the time building integrated solar envelope systems, we just talk about TASK 56. So this was my short introduction. We have three speakers today. The first one is Roberto Fritschi. He is leader of the Sustainable Heating and Cooling Systems Research Group at the Italian Research Institute, OIREC. He leads several projects in the field of residential buildings retrofit and utilization of heat pumps and cold district heating networks. And he is the chair of Task 56. Roberto's presentation will deal with the analysis of these so-called biases systems, either market ready or prototype status. These biases systems include multifunctional facade elements, integrating solar thermal, photovoltaics and or natural lighting control devices. The systems have been assessed through a SWOT analysis, looking at the strengths and weaknesses of the different technologies. So I'm looking forward to the speech of Roberto. Please go ahead. Thank you, Berben, and good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, hope you can see my screen. Let me close here. Okay, good. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Berber, for this introduction. Um, and yeah, um, today I'm here uh, as uh, operating agent, chair of this Task 56, which is focused on building integrated solar envelope system for heating, cooling, uh, and ventilation, and for lighting. A quite long and complex uh, title, just to say. Just to say uh, that we are working on uh, multi multifunctional uh, envelope solutions that use solar uh, technologies integrated to, in, into them. And uh, when we uh, speak about solar technologies, uh, we uh, include uh, solutions that use uh, solar energy, like solar thermal and photovoltaic panels, to produce energy for, or to generate energy for the building itself or again uh, solutions that control the solar energy that, ent that is entering into the building like uh, uh, shading elements and sh shading systems. So basically we are looking into a very uh, a quite diversified market that moves from uh, the, uh, the technology that you see on the, on the left side of my slide um, which is uh, basically um, a shading element allowing a lot of uh, uh, sunlight entering in, in a building without uh, or uh, avoiding uh, glare, so direct uh, um, illumination, and moves uh, down to, uh, say, um, photovoltaic and, and solar and combined uh, photovoltaic and solar thermal systems integrated in the uh, roof 
uh, of the house on the uh, right uh, picture. And that uh, again uh, produces uh, electricity from, from the PV panels and also um, hot air uh, for, for space heating mainly. Uh, important uh, aspect of our uh, program, of our project, is that we are not lo only looking into the uh, architectural integration of these elements into the envelope itself, we are also looking into how uh, the single technologies influence the heating, the heating and cooling demand of the building, the energy consumption to cover this demand, and again, uh, how the technologies influence the thermal and uh, uh, lighting comfort, uh, luminous comfort of the of the building itself. So we look into the facade, into the envelope, but we try to also understand what is the effect of the technology onto the uh, living areas. And to do this, um, basically what we did in the project and we are still um, doing is to look into uh, what is happening in research and in industry. So we looked and, and listed on our website that you uh, see uh, reported on, on top of the slide. Uh, we uh, reported on um, uh, ongoing and, and already finished uh, uh, research projects that are uh, focused on, on the development of these uh, kind of solutions. But we looked also on the open, uh, openly available literature uh, on the topic. Um, obviously, we didn't uh, we didn't stop uh, to this uh, level. So actually, we didn't only listed uh, say what is going on, but we tried also to um, rate and to analyze what is happening. So basically, uh, on a range of uh, solutions that we found uh, that we found on the market, but uh, but also um, solutions that are under development in in the labo in the different laboratories around the world. What we did is to try to uh, perform a SWOT analysis. So basically, we asked uh, uh, researchers and manufacturers to describe briefly the concept, uh, looked into again architectural and technical integration uh, issues but also um, asking them to um, say describe the system and the comfort uh, um, aspects uh, related to the integration related to the use of their uh, technologies once we add this we also try to perform a SWOT analysis which is basically trying to understand which are strengths and weaknesses of the technologies and what are opportunities and threats uh, um, that are uh, created or generated by the uh, by the market itself. And out of this, uh, for each of the technologies, we try to um, um, extract some lessons learned, um, and uh, we tried also to look at the overall picture, uh, um, trying to um, uh, say extract once more lessons for the entire uh, market again including um, shading uh, shading systems so natural lighting control systems pv integrated and solar thermal integrated so a very wide uh, market in the end so basically what we did is to look into um, uh, solutions that are uh, market available and producing thermal energy uh, like in this case or uh, PV electricity, but we also looked into solutions like this uh, that control uh, the natural light uh, entering the, uh, the 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 single uh, the single rooms, and for each of these technologies and structuring uh, the the overall um, the overall range of solutions in terms of market available and uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, under development uh, in the in the labs, what we did is to prepare this kind of forms, in which uh, we, uh, as I said, describe the technology and then perform this SWOT analysis, and we try to uh, draw some conclusions, some lessons learned. Um, each of these uh, forms is going to be included in a report that is uh, uh, going to be concluded and published uh, hopefully next uh, next month and it will be um, available to everybody to read uh, on, on, our, on our website. 
Um, as I uh, just said, uh, that is not uh, yet available, uh, yet ready, but uh, we can, uh, in any case, um, say, talk about uh, or uh, yeah, discuss around some uh, initial conclusions that we could uh, draw out of this analysis and that we try to, um, uh, say, structure into barriers that are uh, and that are there uh, and that are, uh, say, uh, breaking the market somehow and uh, into opportunities that these uh, kind of solutions are providing to the market itself. So um, starting from the barriers um, and again from the technical uh, perspective, uh, what we found uh, as a common um, uh, as a common point, a common uh, say um, issue, uh, is that uh, from the design point of view and uh, from the installation point of view, the single uh, say multifunctional facade solar envelope systems are uh, tailor-made uh, solutions so far. Therefore, again, the design and the uh, mounting process can be uh, time-consuming and uh, be prone to to um, to, to errors. Um, on the other end, um, a barrier uh, which is um, quite uh, quite relevant is that the market is looking for flexible and uh, interchangeable solutions. So, again, this is something uh, that is not easy to um, to tackle for. Um, standardized solutions like PV panels or solar thermal uh, collectors because obviously the size, <coughs> excuse me, the size uh, of the single elements is fixed most of the time. Uh, on the other end, uh, from, uh, from the technical point of view, when you integrate a, um, a solution, a new technology into the envelope of a building, that, st uh, that starts to be a construction material. And again, then uh, in addition to a normal installation, uh, one should take into consideration what are the typical problems of a single uh, of a of a of a, gen a generic construction. So, again, um, air air diffusion through the facade, vapor diffusion through the facade, and also fire risk uh, need to be um, tackled uh, during the design phase, and they need to be solved. Uh, again. This is one of the main uh, issues that we found uh, in, in our analysis. Uh, from the regulation and, legis uh, and legislation point of view, we uh, found that uh, norms and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and laws are continuously changing. And when I say continuously, I mean uh, that they are changing in time, year after year, but they are changing also uh, in uh, in space, meaning that uh, the, the the legislation is quite um, variable uh, from region to region and from uh, uh, country to country. And then again, it is not really easy for manufacturers to tackle uh, different uh, different markets. <clears throat> again, test methods are not really uh, there yet. Uh, once more. Um, there are single test methods for solar collectors, PV systems, and so on and so forth. But again, when you integrate them into a facade, new uh, requirements uh, are, are, um, uh, are coming uh, into place. And uh, say the, the actual standards are not uh, re um, replicating to, the, to, this, uh, to these new uh, issues. Uh, I wouldn't go too much into the details now because the time is uh, limited, but uh, we can discuss about this, for example, in the uh, question and answer uh, slot. Uh, planning. Um, again, the technologies are few and not very well known by energy planners and architects that need uh, normally or that, new, that they use normally some design uh, guidelines or pre um, pre feasibility uh, tools or pre planning tools uh, in their in their designing process and again uh, with respect to these solutions uh, uh, we notice that we miss these really easy to use uh, rules and and planning tools which is again quite a, a, a high barrier uh, to the to the market from the architectural point of view, um, I think I already uh, sum out um, 
uh, touch this point. Uh, architects like um, versatile shapes, colors, and textures and sizes. Um, so uh, basically, uh, uh, what is um, happening uh, is that um, a manufacturer tackling the market should um, should also take this in, in into consideration. Um, and uh, finally, uh, from the economic and uh, economic and, and social point of view, um, we have uh, obviously a initial cost. The technologies are not really widespread on the market, so due to innovation, we uh, still have um, we we still notice quite uh, relevant investment costs, upfront uh, costs, and again, as I said before, um, the technologies are not really much uh, known by the uh, by the architects and uh, and uh, and planners plus uh, however they are not really much known by, by the by the installers so probably also here there is quite a lot of work to to go before uh, these become uh, say widespread solutions on the market um, Despite these, um, say, high barriers uh, that I mentioned, the market, a small market, is there, and we notice that the solutions. There are some solutions available on the market that offer some uh, good opportunities, uh, and that they are having some uh, success uh, on the market uh, um, because they are uh, tackled by by architects and that they are uh, considered by um, architects and, and planners as a suitable solution. And without going or talking about the single ones, the ones uh, that are having success so far, uh, they have all common, uh, say, features, and uh, uh, which I try to uh, summarize here. And on the one hand, uh, they are easy to manufacture, uh, to manufacture and to dismantle. It's really important for, uh, for planners <clears throat> Again, to to make them suit, suitable for installers, they they are they need to be also easy to integrate in the facade, in the envelope elements, in the envelope of the building uh, as a whole. Um, not um, secondary, they must be uh, easy to communicate. And again, this is because um, the um, the decision on how to uh, on what to use as a construction material takes place in the first phases of the um, construction of the planning of the building so um, um, it is not possible to go into a very detailed planning into a very um, detailed um, uh, for example for example numerical simulation to decide if the solution is to be used or not so it must be really um, easy uh, to to say uh, to or to convince uh, plan, uh, planners and architects to use them uh, once more, um, the solution, um, uh, the target, the, the, the target share uh, stakeholder uh, should be architects and energy planners. So uh, the solution should um, uh, um, should be foldable about uh, around their uh, their needs. Uh, again, aesthetics uh, for sure is one of the main um, the main um, issues, my main concern, and this has to be uh, um, uh, very well um, say thought from the very beginning of the uh, development of uh, one technology. And again, uh, this solution must be foldable around the uh, needs of the of the architects instead of. Uh, trying to to propose something to architects and then asking them to to uh, to um, adapt to the solution. Uh, once more, from the contractual point of view, one of the issues uh, issues that is coming out all the time is robustness, uh, robustness and reliability. Um, people want to know uh, owners or investors want to know investors. Sorry, want to know how long uh, is the um, is the technology last when uh, when that is going to uh, when that is when that will be installed in the envelope and uh, how much maintenance is going to be uh, required so again all these uh, issues 
uh, need to be um, to be solved in advance uh, bef uh, when when the design of the technology starts and again uh, it has to uh, to do with manufacturing dismantling and easy to integrate and to operate uh, aspect um, <clears throat> Just to conclude, uh, as I was saying, uh, we try to look into, into what is available and list it. All this information that is going to be published into, uh, into, the, um, into the report uh, next month, it is also going to be published into a gallery that you find on the, on the internet. Uh, for now, the uh, gallery uh, is quite uh, yeah, limited. Um, an initial version of what we want to obtain. So um, when you go there and click on the images, you find an, an, some initial information. By the end of the next month, you will find the overall set of uh, information. Um, that's it from my side. Thank you for listening. And uh, I think there will be some time for questions and answers at the end of the three presentations. So Berber, back to you. Exactly, Roberto, thank you very much. Interesting SWOT analysis, if researchers uh, assess technologies very well, I think that's very market oriented. So we will have Q&A session at the end. That means that we will go straight to the second uh, speaker. He is a colleague of Roberto in task 56 and from Austria. Fabian Ox is working at the Austrian in, um, University of Innsbruck within the unit of energy efficient buildings since 2009, where he is teaching in the field of building physics and system simulations. He works in and leads several national and international research projects dealing with energy systems and renewable energies for very efficient buildings. Fabian's presentation will focus on biases, which include a broad variety of technologies. Different solutions for office and residential buildings have been simulated. This allows to assess the impact of these multifunctional facades on indoor air quality, thermal and visual comfort, and energy performance. So, thank you, Fabian. Yours is the floor. Go, go ahead. Okay, hello everybody. Berber, thank you much for this introduction. And Roberto, thank you for the good overview, which will directly bring us into my topic. So detailed performance assessment of building integrated solar envelope systems by means of numerical simulations. We saw from Roberto that there are a lot of technical, but also non-technical uh, relevant issues. Uh, and for now, we will concentrate on the technical ones, basically, the energetical ones and the economical ones. And to address these issues, we use the methodology of uh, building simulation and building and system simulation. Um, so uh, just a brief recap. So we uh, investigate as uh, solar envelope solutions, the use of renewable energies integrated into the facade or the envelope. Uh, and usually those are integrated together with a kind of HVAC system, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Uh, in yeah, which is mainly nowadays heat pumps, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, but also other solutions. And we address uh, the needs of heating and of domestic water preparation as well as for cooling. And then, as we have also seen from Roberto, there is uh, another big topic, topic which is daylighting, uh, which is basically uh, more the focus in office buildings and maybe schools, as we see one on the picture right hand side. And I will skip a little bit this topic because there will be the third presentation by my former colleague Martin Hauer, who will concentrate on that topic. We have uh, different solar envelope solutions. Uh, here is example solar thermal, uh, a solar wall, um, and, and um, here solar, solar roofs also integrated into the facade. And to evaluate those systems, we need to understand how they interact with the energy system. So as I already mentioned, can be a heat pump or other systems like a condensing boiler. And to decide um, the performance of those systems and also to decide um, the design, the sizing uh, of the components or um, also interesting in particular for policy uh, is technology ranking. So should you use um, PV, should you use for a specific application, a specific climate, solar thermal, 
um, or PVT maybe, um, that is a relevant question. Um, also again, um, one slide on daylighting. Um, also here we have the influence of heating and cooling, of course. So the, the more we use shading, uh, the more we will influence the heating demand and also the cooling demand. And all those things have to be decided on system and building level and cannot be decided on common component level. This is why we believe that one, um, yeah, one important um, tool that is required to uh, penetrate the market is um, evaluation tool for those systems that show the benefits, but also assists um, in the sizing and dimensioning of those systems. I want to show you one example here, uh, which is a passive house in Innsbruck, quite reasonably built and is a, a nice uh, PV facade. And uh, yeah, well, to decide whether this is a good system or not is basically not so easy to decide from the photo. So obviously it cannot be wrong to put all the facade, uh, uh, to uh, put PV on all the facade, but in order to decide which uh, heating system you should go for, in this case, they did even decide to go for electric heating and electric domestic water because uh, they believed that providing with PV will be um, kind of green solution. Uh, but basically to decide whether this is a good solution or not uh, is not so easy without really looking into detail and understanding the behavior of the building and the system. So we need uh, the components um, I listed here, sorry for all the operations, solar thermal, building integrated solar thermal PV, building integrated PVT, PI PVT. And then we have the building. The building can be a different type of building, a school, a single family house, multi-family house, an office building, and it has a technical system. Um, and what we want to do in uh, subtask C of task 56 is to develop methodologies, how to um, yeah, evaluate and then also rank and uh, but more important how to, to size um, and um, yeah, dimension those systems and to give some design guidelines in order to enable market penetration of those systems. So we need, of course, the component level which is, for example, uh, let's take a PV uh, T collector, the performance map can be uh, generated um, by measurements. Then we need the system level, so that PV collector can be, for example, used as a source for the heat pump. Um, and then uh, we need to integrate it into the building, so it could be in a, a single family house with passive standard or in another type of building. And finally, that is another aspect that is more the uh, macroeconomic scale, uh, that will, if all buildings uh, do in the same way, that will also have an influence on district, city, or maybe even country level. So um, if you have a lot of PV facades uh, that will um, be connected to a certain type of system setup that will be will, uh, inject electricity, PV electricity into the grid, and th so that will also have influence in the surroundings. So we need both, we need a kind of microeconomic optimization, which is the system design sizing, the control. Um, and of course, we at the end, we want to have a, a cost optimal solution, uh, but also the macroeconomic one, which is more the technology ranking and maybe to predict uh, for certain technologies, uh, primary energy savings or CO2 savings, and also the overall costs, which is, for example, could give a good hint for regulation of subsidies, uh, how, how sh they should uh, establish their rules. Um, so we have um, to distinguish between the cost for the building owner or operator and the cost for society. And of course, both, we have to have a look on it. So um, I, because of the lack of time, I cannot give you too much details, but um, I want to a little bit brief introduce you briefly to the methodology we try to develop. And we have developed different methodologies for residential buildings and for office buildings. Um, we use not only simulation, but also monitoring results, which is relevant to validate our tools, but also um, to, yeah, for, the, for the trust on the market, say you need um, put our best practice examples. And finally, out of those simulation results and monitoring uh, results, we want to develop design tools and decision support tools. And one of those tools you will uh, hear from my uh, former colleague Martin Hauer in the next presentation. Now I will focus on one um, example we did for an office building. And here we have a very simple office cell. And um, so first of all, you need to decide on if you um, evaluate different systems, what is the performance indicators you want to use, so the KPIs. And here, of course, we need the energy related ones, heating and cooling, but also uh, thermal comfort. 
then the indoor quality is uh, of relevance, the visual comfort, and finally the uh, primary GMC2 savings and um, the um, capitalized cost of the different solutions. So we uh, developed this um, simple office cell in different platforms in order to enable all, uh, say, researchers that use different tools to deliver um, results that are comparable. Um, on those platforms we, we tested is uh, Transys, is uh, Matab Simulink, then we use Modelica, uh, Energy Plus, and Ida Ice as simulation tools. And also we compare those results to the results of planning tools like Dalek and PHPP. So what we did, we did uh, start with three different climates. Uh, one Nordic, one Stockholm, one Central European, one Stuttgart, and Rome as a, uh, an example of a warm climate. Uh, and we first of all compared the simulation results for heating and cooling demands for the different tools. Um, and it was quite a heavy exercise, even so it's quite a simple tool, or simple, say, simple exercise, the office building. Um, but we include the energy system, um, so the, uh, or the control, and um, it was really already quite an exercise, um, and you can find detailed analysis in the publication I mentioned here on the slide. Um, bringing those different tools together. And there is um, influences of the model itself, of the tool and how it is modeled, but also the modeler cannot be, uh, yeah, has some influence. So um, at the end, we found a quite good comparison, which gives us confidence that uh, you can um, use different tools um, to compare the results. But still, there are some deviations, in particular in some months. So, um, this was one lesson learned. You can use all the different tools available, but you have to be really careful with um, per, say, um, correctly calibrating your tool to the specific task. This is an example for uh, the moderate climate in Stuttgart. And here in Rome, um, it works uh, also well for, for cooling. Um, the deviations are in the same order of magnitude, um, while the relative deviations for heating of obviously higher, but uh, because of the very low heating demand in Rome, it, uh, the relative deviations are not so significant, but actually, um, I will come to this later um, and the comparison of the climates in one example. So that was uh, really already a um, heavier exercise than we expected, uh, but now we um, have quite good results. And I will show you now just very simple example. We connect now this simple office cell with a, a PV um, facade and connect this facade with a uh, heat pump uh, and uh, alternatively also use a battery in order to yeah, come up with a, a quite simple system still, but integ integrate the PV into the system and see the influence. At the end, uh, we will see already from the different curves here of the heating and cooling demand that um, obviously uh, we have um, in, in the winter season, uh, high demand and in the summer season and in the intermediate season uh, we will have a kind of floating zone and uh, the question is now how we evaluate different solutions so what you see uh, and and this in different climates uh, you see here quite complex diagrams i try to uh, give you a short overview so this is um, on the left hand side for rome then in the center for stuttgart and on the right hand side for stockholm we see the 12 months of the year in each diagram and the different contributions of the consumers. So let's go to Stuttgart. Um, we have in, uh, in summer here the peak for cooling. We have in winter um, the heating. And then on top of that, we have appliances, we have lighting. And here I must uh, give you the additional information that this is a standard lighting, not a efficient one, uh, because we want to show the um, saving potential by using also um, daylighting concepts and efficient lighting. Uh, but anyway, um, and then we have uh, also um, auxiliary energies. And what you can see that uh, this shape is not so different uh, between Rome, Stuttgart and Stockholm. So we have, uh, because of the, the office building, um, we have um, in all three climates a significant cooling demand. And we have a heating demand, which is more or less the same um, in Stockholm and Stuttgart. It's not exactly the same, but in the same order of magnitude. And it's uh, obviously lower in Rome. What is different is the shape of solar energy. We can harvest uh, with the PV and then use uh, for appliances and for the auxiliary and for the heat pump. Um, and you see that in particular in Stockholm, 
there is quite a significant uh, difference between the available solar and the, um, the the heating in winter, whereas in in Rome, because it's in the facade, it's uh, more or less constant. So the question is now how to evaluate those different uh, behavior. And what we suggest is to use uh, monthly um, primary energy conversion factors. Um, and here is uh, one example of a simple energy predicting model, which uh, if you want to have more detailed information, you can also find the paper on that, um, which investigates uh, different scenarios of how the electricity mix will be developed in uh, future years. So we uh, will have as a simplification, uh, electricity mix, which consists of a part of hydro, a part of wind and some PV obviously, um, and the rest um, as long, um, as we uh, will increase the number of renewables, uh, there will be some fossil left. And uh, the number of, or the share of fossil will influence then also the shape of the uh, primary en energy conversion factors, which is this blue line here. And this is one, one simple example. And now I compare in the next slide, three different, basically uh, five different scenarios, uh, two sub-scenarios. Uh, if you take the primary energy conversion factor that is usually uh, used on European level, um, which uh, is 2.4 constant over the course of the year, compared to two different scenarios, that was one too fast, sorry for that, uh, the blue line is, uh, say, moderate increase of uh, renewables, and then the uh, light red one is a significant increase of um, um, renewables, and then we can use always the average value again to have a constant value over the year, or we use the, the shape. Uh, we have more solar, basically PV in, in summer. This is why we have higher factors in winter than in summer. And interesting is to compare now uh, the different um, solar technologies, active facades, together with different HVAC configurations, and then uh, also related uh, to different scenarios of how the energy system will develop. And of course, this is also an interaction between. So the energy system also will depend on how much uh, solar facades we will use. Um, and here is one example of a set of results. So what we show here is the cost saving, uh, the, the additional costs um, as a function of the primary energy savings. So typically you would expect if you have uh, a lot of um, high efficient technology and a lot of renewables that will lead to some extra costs, uh, but you will um, increase your primary energy savings. Um, and what we group here is uh, we use uh, compared to the reference system, which is electric heating, uh, only a heat pump. We can use uh, only PV. We can use um, heat pump plus PV and then include a battery storage uh, to increase the self consumption of PV. And finally, we make all we use heat pump plus PV plus battery. And that will, of course, lead to the highest primary energy savings related to uh, the reference system um, and will obviously also have um, some higher costs. So um, we have also three different colors here. And the colors are the results for the three different climates. So generally, you see um, a similar trend that, um, of course, in um increasing using pv uh, will um, lead to savings in all three climates but what you can see and this is interesting um, at least uh, using the boundary conditions and uh, assumptions um, we used uh, you will get in rome because of the high um, pv generation and high uh, higher cooling demand uh, using pv gives you uh, energy savings but also cost savings whereas in the other climates uh, you have energy savings but not cost savings um, using only the heat pump um, comes with less savings but higher costs so you would go for pv first and then heat pump for heating if you combine it uh, even better and so we can evaluate different systems um, without going into more detail but uh, if you now change the assumption of your energy system so from the primary energy uh, eu mix of 2.4 constant over the course of the year and we change now to a scenario then the um, things a little bit change and that is interesting um, the trends of the overall trends does not change, but uh, that might be for some technologies. Uh, so it is really also relevant um, what kind of um, energy system we expect in future and um, how, how we plan for the next uh, 20 or 40 years on macroeconomic scale. 
Um, as I do not have uh, much time left, I will just go to the next slide and show you the comparison of three different um, energy scenarios. So we have here the U-mix. We have here the mix with um, 10, um, 10, oh, sorry, there's a confusion, 10, 30, that must be 10, 30, 30. Um, I will correct that for, uh, for the published uh, slides. And then here's the 10, 10, 10. And um, the more we go to um, a higher um, renewable energy grid, uh, the less uh, savings you will have, obviously, because the grid is already full of PV, but that influences different technologies in different, different ways. So if you use, um, for example, um, here, um, that is the heat pump plus PV, they are still a quite high influence, whereas if you only use PV, that influences less um, that is less influenced by the assumption of the grid electricity mix. So um, using that uh, kind of methodology, um, we, we believe that uh, in future we can give a better picture to ranking of technologies and also to, to give some policy advice uh, and advice for subsidies. As time is uh, running out, I just want to show you uh, within here this uh, one for last slide uh, that all those simulation results should also be uh, useful, of course, for the engineers and the planners and the architects. And therefore, we need not only detailed um, simulation tools, but uh, decision and or design and decision support tools. And uh, we work further on one tool, which is the PHPP, which is uh, used quite widely in passive house design, but uh, can uh, be really a good uh, use also for uh, renovation, planning renovations and using of biases systems. Uh, what we are going uh, to do or, and already done and uh, it's ongoing work is compare always the simulation with PHP calculations, um, adopt and improve the algorithms and uh, yeah, make it uh, even more reliable tool and a more widely usable tool as it already is. And I really can recommend to use it for your design. I want to conclude that, um, so we investigate those solar active facades, uh, which is multifunctional facades, and we have to um, investigate it with, in the system context. Um, we have to distinguish between the different uh, needs, heating, cooling, electricity, or uh, daylighting, which will bring you to the next presentation. Uh, we need the component level characterization, the building level, and also for a better market penetration, uh, it is very relevant to come up with the source design tools, which I just mentioned at the end. Yes, and with that last slide, uh, I want to thank you and yeah, wish you um, a good final presentation from my from Nick Martin. Well, thank you, Fabian. I think this showed very well what a simulation can bring into, you know, like understanding of interaction between renewables in the grid and technologies used in the facade. Thank you very much for that. There are already a lot of questions coming in. We will raise them after the last presentation. And in the meantime, I will share some uh, less, like, some questions um, through the chat box with the speaker so they, they can prepare themselves to the questions a bit. Well, our last speaker is called Martin Hauer. He is, has an interesting background of private sector and research. So he uh, studied eco -engineer, energy engineering at the University of Applied Science Upper Austria and received his PhD from the University of Innsbruck. He, his work focused on daylight research with a strong connection of building physics. In March this year, he changed to the private sector and he's now working as project manager at the R&D department at Bartenbach, an architectural office in Austria. In his presentation, Martin will introduce the free web tool Dalek, which allows combined thermal and lighting simulations of facades. In a joint effort with the Austrian company Zumtobel and the University of Innsbruck, Bartenbach, the Austrian architectural company, launched Dalek in 2014. The tool supports building designers and architects in early planning when they are about to decide on daylight, daylight solutions and interior lighting. So Martin, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Hello, everybody. So, 
I hope you can see my screen. Yep. Okay, good. Okay, welcome also from my side. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction, Babel. So, as uh, Babel said today, I'm talking about uh, the combined terminal and lightning simulation for envelope systems, uh, especially for pre-design. Um, maybe as some of you don't know uh, in detail what Badenbach maybe is doing, so I'll give you a short introduction into this. So basically Badenbach is a lightning consulting company and uh, it's well known especially for its innovative solutions on artificial lighting and daylighting. Uh, we are around 90 employees and we also quite a big uh, planning department, of course, but also are doing research and development quite quite a lot. So just looking shortly on different divisions we have. Uh, so lighting design, of course, I'm mainly doing uh, integrative day and artificial lighting design. Um, then lighting solutions, um, going really towards uh, developing the whole concept of the lighting uh, solution, so to say. And then the department I'm belonging to, uh, research and development. So we are mainly focusing on the field of uh, light impact uh, or daylight impact on beings, uh, product development, of course, and also the topic of daylighting and energy performance analysis, which I will address in this speech. Good, so going into the topic of uh, my webinar now. So when we talk about uh, daylight requirements from the facade, uh, we have, uh, kind of a concurring situation. I mean, we have three uh, aspects we should address well. Uh, the one is the visual comfort, of course. Then we have the topic of uh, energy demand or, or overheating uh, issues. And then we have the third part, which is the non-visual uh, criteria connected to uh, daylight and artificial light. So the visual part, of course, it's um, uh, going to the daylight distribution in the room and also the level itself. It goes about the glare protection uh, and the view to the outside. And we can optimize, let's say, a facade to this part of the visual uh, visual aspect, but it's not the whole story of the thing. So we also have to look on the solar gains, which is directly addressed to the energy demand in the end. So we should avoid, of course, overheating in summer. Uh, and by this reducing uh, excessive uh, solar gains in this case. Um, and the non-visual part directly is connected to the uh, visual part. That means uh, using as much daylight as possible and trying to um, enhance the situation if possible also with the artificial lighting. Uh, systems which are used for this are kind of these ones here where we have uh, the two uh, different facade parts. So we have on the top part here a redirecting part and in the bottom a shading part. And then here already comes the question into mind, okay, we have to control this, um, this facade somehow in an efficient way. So in this case, if we would have a facade without any control or any shading blind, of course, we would have problems with uh, visual discomfort, thermal stress, or at least excessive cooling loads, um, glare issues, what we see here. And then, um, of course, this guy would not feel very comfortable here. And instead, by using a proper shading device, um, we can, uh, of course, get rid of most of these problems. We have a reasonable uh, luminance levels on the facade, so it means no glare. Uh, we have no overheating by reduced solar gains. And of course, it can be that we need the artificial lighting additionally because we shade here, but by innovative solutions, also this should be uh, addressed that we even can reduce here the artificial lighting. So in the end, um, quite a simple uh, case here. And the question is, we have now different aspects what we have to address and at least it would be nice to have a tool which is capable to show all these different uh, inter interoperabilities in the very first stage uh, and that's basically the motivation which uh, why Dalek came up. So when we look on the different tools which are available on the market for doing simulations. Um, I mean, we all know them quite well, I think here, uh, like Transis Energy Plus um, for the thermal part. When it goes to complex uh, situations, of course, these tools are the, the tools to use or which should be used, of course. 
but when it comes to more easy situation like we just discussed before then these tools take a lot of time uh, probably we have not all the input data in the very beginning in the early design phase so it should be really simplified and that's that's really the the, the motivation or the main goal of the uh, providing of Dalek in the end and just showing here let's say a vision what we want to have in the end um, uh, is uh, just an energy demand for example over the whole year what we see here or then also results about the daylight availability in the room or even overheating of frequency for example so very fast and easy uh, figures where we can see how a certain facade design can affect affect the situation so all of you would be able just to start uh, the Dalek tool now because it's uh, available as online web tool. So just follow here this uh, web link and you can uh, see this interface uh, basically uh, developed within a research project um, uh, from Badenbach, then also University of Innsbruck and some Tobel Lighting were involved in this research project. And now I would just go a little bit more into deep or into detail what's behind this uh, tool here. Um, so basically we can uh, say the concept is uh, separated in four main modules and one control module here in the middle. So concerning location, so we start somewhere from a certain location with a certain climate data, we get some exterior luminance from the weather file and then we calculate the daylight as um, the daylight contribution in the room based on a specific facade setting. Then we get the interior daylight levels uh, on the two different uh, measuring points at the working plane and can therefore calculate back to the artificial light demand by the artificial light module. Of course, there are some interactions again with the user for the switching on, off or dimming mode and in the end, what is important for the thermal model in the end, we need the input of the artificial light demand, means a heating gain by the artificial lighting. And then of course we need uh, external conditions like uh, radiation and external temperature, or of course also kind of the solar gains, which interferes with the thermal model. In the end, we came up with an energy demand for heating, cooling and lighting for the whole year. And of course also daylighting uh, and uh, artificial lighting results of what we have seen before, but we will see a little bit more later on. But now let's go through. Uh, we start with this uh, location module and climate data module. So what's behind here? Basically in Dalek, uh, almost all uh, stations which are available in the, uh, let's say in the team Y2 or in the EPBW or EPW files, all the stations are included in Dalek and you see here the dots on the world map so it's quite a lot and yeah you can just freely freely choose by these different locations and then uh, you can do your calculation based on this uh, situation so you cannot choose some specific point like uh, it's for other simulation tools uh, possible so you really have to choose one of these spots here. Uh, in the daylight module, um, there is basically integrated uh, the free phase method from Radiance. If you're familiar with this, so uh, the free phase method, uh, just an, let's say, a very efficient way how to uh, do daylight simulations, yearly daylight simulations for especially complex uh, glazing systems. So in the end, we have here some sky situation, uh, we have some facade situation, and we have a room situation. And each of these situation is described by one of these matrices here. So for example, the sky distribution describes where the sun is situated and what amount of luminance we get from the sun. Then here we see how much the facade sees from the sky. Here we have the BSDF, which shows in which direction uh, the solar radiation in the room is uh, transmitted and then we have the view matrix which tells you on which point in the room the daylight is so to say hitting. Um, there is some intelligent pre-calculation process behind so we don't have to do this calculation in the time step that's why Dalek is also very fast in calculations so within several seconds or even less we have the result for a yearly situation and these are stored in a, in a database. So of course we did also some uh, 
validation. So this was done by a former colleague of me uh, in his PhD thesis, uh, showing here a facade situation with uh, measurements. Um, we see here a comparison of measurement and simulation, and which is fitting very well for the overcast sky. And even when we go for a clear sky situation, so with direct sun component, we have slightly higher deviations, um, of course, because we are kind of simplifying a little bit the sky or the sun situation with the free phase method, but still we are for yearly balance, we are getting very good results here. So going to the last module, the artificial light, or not the last, the almost last module, artificial light module. Um, this is basically based on the uh, lumen efficiency method and was mainly designed or developed by uh, the part of zoom double lighting. Um, so we have here different, two different uh, luminaire groups, one and two, one facade near and one facade far. And then there is a database behind with pre-calculated factors, uh, let's say for the for the lumen output. So that means we have different possibilities uh, to uh, show or to, let's say, represent uh, luminaires uh, with uh, quite direct uh, distribution of the of the light. Here we see here that we have, uh, for example, two more beam spots. We have a clear diffuse distribution or here just uh, indirect light, which means it, it's just uh, lighted toward the ceiling and then goes down into the room by into reflections. For the thermal module, in the end, um, there is incorporated the quasi-static um, model based on the EN ISO 13790. Um, so this is, uh, let's say, it's an hourly uh, based uh, method. It's not fully dynamic, but uh, it's, of course, in including uh, all the uh, different aspects of changing weather situations during the day in each hour and also the internal gains are uh, flexibly integrated based on the occupancy situation. Uh, input of course weather data as we said, the artificial light gain and the solar gain through the facade and then as output we have the energy demand for heating and cooling and we see also then interior temperatures uh, so that we really can uh, see a trend okay where would we might have problems uh, with overheating situation. Um, this ISO standard is actually already outdated a little bit. So we have the latest one, the 52006. Um, uh, so there are plans to update it, but so far we are still with this ISO standard, even if it's not the last standard anymore, we are going to uh, reasonable results or yeah, good results. Um, concerning the facade module, um, of course we have on the other hand side, just the glazing, what we can uh, uh, calculate or include, but then also the uh, facade system is possible. So meanings of a shading system or a daylight, even daylight redirecting systems. Uh, for glazing systems, it's quite easy. Let's say there's a known angular dependency of the G value and the transmittance based on the angular incidence. Uh, for shading systems, this is a little bit more complex. That's why we have, uh, as already mentioned before in the daylight module, this uh, BSDF approach here. In Dalek, there are not BSDFs itself, but we have this angular dependent G value, which is directly including, uh, let's say, the BSDFs of the shading and also the glazing systems behind them. And we have then for 145, uh, different incident directions uh, and angular dependent G value, which describes the thermal situation uh, very well. Good, and for the last module, it's the occupant and control module. So more or less, this is the controller of all the four outside modules we have seen before. So how all these modules are interacting and in the end also representing the user, how the user is doing. So we have, basically uh, two different control uh, methods. I mean, the one main control is the thermal control uh, regarding the radiation on the facade. So if you have a certain amount of radiation on the outer facade, the facade setting changes, for example, closing the blinds, or we have too high interior temperatures, uh, meanings too high 
heating and cooling loads, then also uh, the facade uh, situation uh, changes. Uh, for the, uh, let's say, the occupant uh, related controls, we have a luminous threshold uh, for the inner side of the facade, means that we get uh, tack we tackle the glare issue. Also here, if the threshold of the luminance gets too high, then we change the facade settings to a shading uh, situation. Uh, and also the internal temperature, of course, then if this gets too high, uh, window ventilation would be activated as the user probably would open the window also in the real situation. Um, so just to show you um, a little bit out of the what was done in the task 56, so I just uh, kept up here with the one with the uh, presentation what uh, Fabian was doing before. So this uh, office box here was simulated in the in the in this case study and compared with the different simulation tools and my colleague. Uh, David Geisler Maroda, he did the calculations with Dalek and uh, the Transit 17 simulations were done by the URAC. Um, and just showing here some results. So, one uh, situation in Stuttgart um, concerning the, energy, the annual energy balance. So, we see a very good uh, over, overlap or um, yeah, agreement here between Transit and Dalek. Uh, when we see, when we look a little bit more in detail into the, let's say, monthly balances, here in the lighting situation, of course, we have uh, no difference because uh, there is a constant schedule behind. I mean, even here, um, Dalek could, of course, um, account a more intelligent way to uh, to cover this uh, lighting uh, lighting loads, but just for comparison reasons, we made it constant here. And for the heating situation, we see that we have here slightly lower heating demands uh, compared to transits in Dalek. And also for the cooling demand, we are a little bit lower. And when we take a look on the results for Stockholm, um, then we see again here the situation is quite, quite the same, so no influence. But for the heating situation here, uh, also here we have uh, even a little bit uh, higher discrepancy bet between transit and, uh, and Dalek. Can be, of course, in this situation that the, the effect of the, let's say, simplified thermal model uh, can have some effect here. Uh, also, maybe the different or the higher differences between inner situation and outside conditions. Uh, I mean, higher, uh, higher these differences between two can have uh, a slightly a slight effect here. So in the end we have here a higher deviation but for the cooling situation for example uh, we have still a very a good fitting between the results. And as a last uh, result also for Roma so again here we are better fitting uh, like in uh, for the northern situation again so for the heating I mean it's almost not uh, mentionable here with this amount but for the cooling which is interesting for Roma we have a very good fit and this is absolutely in the in the feasible range because we always have to think about the aspect that we talk about early design phase and in this stage we have that less accuracy in data input for uh, sometimes that uh, with this um, let's say with these deviations we are more than uh, on the safe side in this case. Um, as my colleague, uh, former colleague uh, Fabian already mentioned, uh, there is a publication on this uh, on this uh, comparison which have been done. Uh, I also want to refer on this. So if you're interested in this result, you can take a closer look here on this paper. And there are more ongoing comparison um, in this uh, task. So now going more towards complex systems, of course, there we are a little bit restricted in terms uh, of FHVAC systems in Dalek, but uh, we are focusing here more strongly on daylight systems and uh, showing the benefits of, of daylight systems um, itself. Okay, so that was more or less all what I wanted to show about uh, Dalek. So in the end, just uh, want to mention here the two funding schemes in which the work was done, of course, Task 56, and also Bodybuild, which is uh, uh, promoted or funded by the Austrian Research Promotion Agency, uh, just to mention this here. And then I say thank you and open for your questions, of course. 
Thank you, Martin. Very interesting uh, results. We have a lot of questions. <laughs> Thanks to all who typed them in. And I think I will start with uh, Roberto's presentation. And there was a very um, straightforward question regarding further companies that have um, innovative next generation concepts, which are energy sprung and EcoWorks. And one of our listeners would like to know, Roberto, whether you have already contact with these companies and where, whether they might be also integrated into your work. Energy sprung and EcoWorks. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, energy Sprong, uh, we know them, uh, obviously, but uh, Energy Sprong uh, say it is an overall concept. Say it is, they are not looking into envelope solutions. They are looking into how make buildings more efficient uh, by a, a standardized, industrialized uh, approach. Um, the the other company not uh, we we are not in contact so I would be happy to to get in contact and uh, yeah um, you can write to me uh, right after the uh, the webinar for this. <clears throat> Good, this is uh, active networking. Um, there's another question, Roberto, to you, uh, which concerns the project you were presenting on Canada, the Concordia University project. Um, somebody wants to know whether there's any interaction with Task 56 and whether the main advantages compared before and after the solution were looked at. Uh, yeah, we have a, um, a good collaboration with Col uh, Concordia University. Uh, they are good partners and contributing a lot to the activities into the task. And uh, actually, they are developing this uh, solution for quite a long time. Uh, this solution is um, used on the one end, as I said. Um, I don't know if I can share my screen, by the way, uh, Arabella. The solution is used uh, anyhow um, to produce uh, on the one end the PV electricity and on the R, uh, and on the other end to uh, warm up uh, air that is flowing through the uh, that is flowing um, through the gap uh, between the the PV panel and the and the roof. Uh, then this uh, um, um, warm air is used to um, feed uh, an air to water heat pump and again uh, to directly heat uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the the indoor air uh, in in winter time during winter time so um, actually the uh, I do not have here at the um, the exact results in terms of what are the benefits in, in, uh, in terms of energy uh, savings uh, for the building with or without the system uh, but again obviously you can increase um, <clears throat> the uh, COP the efficiency of the heat pump by quite a lot um, as you can imagine you can take uh, cold air uh, from outside warm it up by uh, some few uh, degrees 10, 20 degrees, if I'm not mistaken. Obviously, that depends on on the on the size of the of the roof and the size of the PVT system. And then, uh, with this uh, much warmer air, feed the uh, feed the heat pump. So compared to using uh, the heat pump um, in a in a cold environment like uh, like Canada, um, or using the the heat pump with a preheated air, that is quite a lot of different difference again if you are interested into um, into specific results you can write to me and I can have you in contact get you in contact with the, with the uh, responsible people so at Concordia thank you great well, I think there were a lot, several questions regarding PVT. Um, there seems to be one confusion, actually, that it's not so clear. If a PV module is integrated into the facade and there's a gap behind the PV, PV system, is this already considered PVT in your simulations because there is a certain heat uh, transfer into the building? Or is this a simple PV solution and not a PVT solution? Maybe Fabian from your simulation part can answer to that. 
Okay, thank you, Bebel, for the question. So um, it's not that I can really give the final definition, uh, but uh, in my eyes, um, we speak about PVT if the temperature is actively, so the solar heat uh, the system um, is producing is actively used, and if it's uh, the PV is just integrated in the facade in an usually architecturally attractive way, then we speak about uh, BIPV. Then there's no active use of the heat, but it of course uh, influences the PV efficiency, and we should. Um, um, yeah, consider this in our calculations or simulations. Um, and yeah, so that is, uh, I would say the definition is PVT is if there's an active use, and that can be either using air uh, as a heat carrier or uh, other fluid like water, usually maybe flake away. Okay, thanks. Um, again to you, um, you had a, a black uh, PVT building in Innsbruck. Um, how much PVT was installed there? Do you know further details on this project? Uh, I have some, yes, so it's uh, it's not PVT, it's only PV in this case. Ah, this is also uh, only PV, okay. It's only PV, it's um, it's even in the tightest sense not BIPV because there's a, a rear ventilation uh, layer, uh, but I think it's quite nicely integrated anyway. Um, so what we do by means of simulation is, but that is ongoing work, I cannot present results now, is investigate how, uh, what would be the benefit of using PVT, for example, or using uh, instead of the PV, which is in the current version, 27 kilowatt peaks. Uh, if we uh, would use a combination of solar thermal and PV uh, instead, so that is what we are going to investigate to analyze different concepts and to um, yeah, rank or evaluate these concepts uh, with respect to others. Okay, thank you. Who of you feel responsible for some market-oriented questions? Like we had one which says, you know, another obstacle for HVAC engineers, they don't like to mix things up. That means that integrated systems are very difficult for them uh, to offer because, um, you know, they earn money by the size of the heating or cooling system and now it's all efficient and all it's building integrated. What are your experiences on that? Maybe Martin even is, is a good candidate for that answer because you are already in the private sector. You, you have to sell efficient buildings. Yes, of course. Um, that's right. I mean, basically in the facade, um, I would say there is always a problem with the contradiction of the different technologies. So, I mean, we as Park, we are definitely not uh, dealing with HVAC integration uh, in detail. So. Um, the, the, let's say the, the, the HVAC part of my two colleagues in the other speeches um, is not our main concern, but what, what for us is of course important when we talk about the integration of the different solutions, how we can fit them uh, best together. And I mean, as the facade mainly should also be, of course, the provider to daylight to the connection towards outside, we have uh, this kind of restrictions here. Um, I think that of course, it depends also on uh, simulation tools we have available or calculation tools, which simplifies, I mean, with the more and more development uh, of, let's say, getting BIM uh, processes also into the simulation uh, part, probably this could be a, a first step or an easier step to integrate this more, means uh, also looking on different technologies in the facade in the early stage. So this could help, um, but yeah, I think this is this is an issue. Uh, what, it's what there is a dealing. conflict. Okay. Mm. Roberto, you have looked a lot at different technologies. I think there are also sometimes windows space because we have this question one from one of our listeners that windows is, uh, you know, liked a lot by users of buildings. So there is, seems to be a conflict uh, between, you know, having an active or actively using facade and an, a window. How do you deal with that? Um, say there are um, obviously um, if you use uh, PV panels and uh, and solar thermal panels in the facade, they cover partly the uh, the, uh, the 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 glazed uh, surface. Uh, but again, there are very good solutions on the one end um, 
say um, with the semi-transparent uh, PV that, it, that can be used on the one end to produce electricity and on the other end to shade uh, or to limit the, the uh, sun, um, the solar energy which is entering the, um, the, the building. On the other end, looking at a solution that are uh, say working on natural light control, uh, there are, for example, uh, solutions like uh, electrochromic uh, materials that, that are now a days uh, included into Windows, and then uh, they can be used uh, together uh, to um, to uh, say have an external uh, um, a view to the exterior and a control of the of the uh, lumin luminous and and uh, thermal comfort in the building. So there are solutions that allow to minimize this conflict at least. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Fabian, you are our defender of solar thermal solutions. We have some listeners who feel that we have talked too much about electricity, PV lightning and all that. Um, you have considered equally collectors in the facade and uh, electric elements, is this correct? Um, yes, we do consider also solar thermal. The uh, fact is that in the recent uh, years, contributions, uh, so demonstrations and also research on solar thermal was reducing. And in in this IEA work, you always uh, say live with those partners that you have. And I must say that the main contributions uh, have been now uh, rather on the PV and heat pump side and not so much solar thermal. While we still um, see a relevance and also investigate it, but its um, reality is that it is a little bit decreasing. It's decreasing, so can you still comment on the thermal storages? There is some questions regarding your load load supply matching on the thermal part and um, you know your, your practical uh, way how you integrate uh, sto storages into your simulations. Yeah, I think that is exactly why we need those uh, building and system simulations to evaluate those systems because obviously storage plays a significant role and storage can be um, the thermal capacity of the building. It can be a dedicated uh, hot water storage or, or maybe even other uh, more specific technologies um, or it can be electric storage and they should be considered in those studies. So what, what we um, propose is to the system simulations on uh, let's say low, below one hour uh, time step and uh, really investigate um, the real behavior and the real uh, potential of using the power set electricity uh, or thermal energy directly, including uh, storage losses, and then um, just process the results in a way that they are uh, easy, easily understandable. And, and this is also why we propose this uh, monthly primary energy factors to see at the end uh, with one key performance indicator and the best ranking of the technologies. Okay, thanks. Um, one short answer on this. Do you use the facade and the roof um, equally? Because there was the impression that you use rather the facade than the roof. Uh, well, the... Um, there's two levels uh, of answers to, to this question. Um, the focus of the task 56 is the facade. Um, and obviously you should use whatever you can um, and we evaluate uh, as well uh, the, using the roof and, and also uh, the facade. But um, yeah, the, the nature of our task is facade integrated systems. Um, in the one demo project I showed, uh, there is basically no roof. Uh, so the uh, small roof that is um, available in this building is facing to the north, so it makes no sense to, to, to make use of it. And there are two other facades that can be used and are not used. And this is some, also some part of the study we are doing, uh, what, what would be the benefit of using the other two facades. Okay, but thanks. Basically, obviously not excluding the roof um, make, makes no sense at all. Yeah. Okay. Ah, good, that we cleared that. Maybe, Roberto, you are the overall expert. Somebody asked, what do you suggest to engineers working in countries with low energy prices? Are they interested in solar facades, which are always more expensive? This is a good <laughs> question. Uh, obviously, uh, the low energy prices make uh, all the business case uh, more complex, uh, but again, um, there are good uh, chances to use um, um, 
solution that say in, in many uh, of those places for example like again coming back to Canada you have very low uh, temperatures during winter and again there are uh, good business cases for using uh, low-tech uh, building integrated solar thermal technologies that produce uh, warm air for example and that allows you to easily um, um, say um, increase the indoor temperature um, so again the um, uh, the, the, the energy price is not the first uh, the first point and uh, the investment cost can vary from technology to, te to, to technology by by several uh, factors okay um, there is a question on fire protection actually as it is an issue to integrate uh, new materials into the building is anybody an expert on this practical question um, I think uh, there are very few experts around uh, on the on the topic, and this is because, as I uh, maybe I can reply to this um, uh, in a very general way. Uh, say the um, this is because uh, mainly the regulation vary from country to country, and they are continuously changing uh, as far as new cases come uh, into place. Um, say so the the only thing I can reply is that um, this issue should be solved um, before going to market, uh, and this has to do again with the question on uh, planners not liking uh, say complicated solution and 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 many into one solutions. Um, as I said, when you integrate active uh, active technologies into the facade, these technologies become a construction material. And again, they should comply with construction regulations. So uh, when whenever a new market is tackled, the construction uh, legislation should be considered and the manufacturer um, integrating say PV panels or thermal whatever technology into the into the envelope should consider this uh, from the very beginning in a way that uh, they do not tackle the market again by simply saying you can take my technology and hang it on the on the wall on the facade or on the roof but saying uh, but providing the planner full um, full solution so they solve all the regulations and they provide uh, um, clear answers to the say to the overall uh, um, needs of the building so again not only fire protection but also uh, they solve uh, clearly um, the, the integration to the eating system and that, that, that is uh, something that we clearly see when we um, look into success story stories say uh, the manufacturers that have a good success on the market are those ones that provide a full uh, solution to the to the planner okay thank you i think that was a very interesting and intensive q a session thank you very much for all the listeners to get involved and challenge you us with your interesting questions thank you very much to all the speakers for these comprehensive insights into your work and i wish you all a nice rest of the day and hand over to arabella for the final words from our isis colleagues thank you and bye bye Arabella? <laughs> ah, sorry, double muted myself. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> sorry for that. Um, thank you, Babel, for doing a great job on the moderation and on the um, guiding us through the webinar. Thank you to our speakers for joining us on that um, webinar as well. Um, we received many, many questions uh, for the Q&A session, and as usual, we can't get through all of them. But what we will try and do is collect all of them in an Excel sheet and then hopefully um, our speakers may find some, some time to get back to um, your questions and we will upload this and share with you as well. So there will be a chance for your question um, to get answered.
So now, before we all end uh, the webinar today, there is some more information I'd like to share with you. And this is both from ISIS and also, I think, in the, in the very best interest of the IEA SHC. And that is a very important web, um, event announcement. And Babel, I think, mentioned it briefly already in the beginning. We have a very big event coming up this November in Chile. It's the ISIS Solar World Congress 2019 together with the SHC 2019 International Conference on Solar Heating and Cooling for Buildings and Industry. The registration for this event is open and there are membership benefits um, you can um, be el eligible for. So this is for sure something to be on the lookout for. This event consists of presentations, forums, workshops, and there are, are of course sponsoring opportunities as well. And we expect that we already have confirmed a great set of binary speakers and keynote speeches. Within this big uh, Congress, we also feature the ninth International Conference on Solar Air Conditioning, that's the SAC 2019, and also the ISRI 2019, as, um, yeah, and that's the International Symposium on Renewable Energy Education. And for all of that, we have loads of information on our websites about how to register, where to stay, what the program looks like right now, who are the speakers that I have confirmed. And you can, can find that on both homepages, that's the Solar World Congress 2019, as well as the SAC 2019. And then next week, going along with this event announcement, we have a webinar coming up again. Um, and it's going to be the ISIS Spotlight on Chile and the Solar World Congress 2019, where um, we will put a special techno um, technology focus on Chile. And we will again introduce you to the event and the different partners that all take um, place in it, let's say. Um, yeah, and so now for my final announcement for everybody for today. I know that, that that is a big concern for you or that's a lot of interest. There will be, of course, a webinar recording and this will be available both on the ISIS as well as the IEA HSE homepage within a few days. Um, and then also for the ISIS members, please remember you already have unlimited access to all ISIS webinars and presentations if you log into your membership area. And the same goes for the presentations as well. They will also be available. And now, on behalf of ISIS, and I think also, of course, of the IEHAC, we thank all of you um, for coming out today and for joining us on the webinar. And again, once once again, um, a great thank you to Babel and our sets of speakers. Um, yeah, we are always looking forward to hear from you um, if you have any feedback or any wishes for future um, webinars. And you can write to us at public.relations at isis.org. And we also very much invite you to complete the little survey that will go out today um, to you in a bit. So I think that's it for today. Thank you again very, very much for joining us. I will now end the webinar and we wish you a great day and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.